question or the need, if you will, to examine why the church doesn't change. And we pointed out this morning that the church doesn't need to change because to begin with, Jesus built it right. He built the church perfect to begin with and therefore it doesn't need to be changed. Second, Jesus being the head of the church has given no new revelation. If Jesus wanted there to be changes in his church, he would have informed us. The fact that there has been no new revelation means that there have been no changes, and so the church doesn't need to change. Any changes made, therefore, are man-made changes. And we concluded by pointing out that the church doesn't need to change because what was true when Jesus bought the church is still true today. Truth has never changed. The truth upon which the church was built is still that same very truth, and those are reasons that the church doesn't need to change. So we begin there uh, as we start to uh, conclude the examination of why the church doesn't need to change. And we see another good reason why the church doesn't need to change is because the seed that produces the church is the Word of God, Luke chapter 8, verse 11. The seed is the Word of God. And when you plant that seed, what is produced today is a Christian. And when Christians are produced and they assemble together, they, com they comprise the church or the kingdom which Jesus built. The seed was intended to change the hearts of men. The hearts of men were never intended to change the seed. The changing was supposed to be on the side of man's part, not on God's part. One of the big reasons with the individuals seeking to make changes with the, the church today is that God never intended for the church to change. He intended for man to change. In fact, the very definition of repentance has to do with changing or uh, turning away from. Conversion has to do with changing, being converted, being changed from what a man used to be to something new, becoming a new creature in Christ. Those involved repentance and they involved conversion. They involved a change of lifestyle. And that change of lifestyle came about through means of the word, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8 verse 11. The word is that which produces the kingdom. The word is that which produces the church. The word is that which uh, produces a Christian today. If we want to establish a new congregation, we simply open up the Bible to see what a congregation of the Lord's church is to look like. And by following that pattern, by planting that seed, if we're only planting what Jesus planted, we plant the same thing He planted. Any changes to it, therefore, are, means that the crop will be something other than what Jesus planted. So when the hearts of men seek to change the seed... They produced something other than what Jesus produced. God wanted the hearts of men to change. When man's heart changed, he would be converted and he would be a member of the church. But today it seems that men want to change the church rather than the other way around. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, beginning. Peter writes, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was for, uh, for ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, 
seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto an unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. It is the word that produces a Christian. It is the word, incorruptible, divine in origin, that produces offspring for Christ. Those who are born again are those who have heard the word and those who have believed it and obeyed it. To change any part of that is to produce something other than what God intended to produce. To change the word is to change the crop. <laughs> to change the seed is to change the production, the result. James says in James 1, 21 and 22, to lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So the word is that by which we have access to salvation. That word is never changing. It's incorruptible. And we are to be doers of the word, not changers of the word. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and verse 3, Paul writes to the church there, saying that in time past they had walked according to their own doing. They, they had walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Individuals who chose to walk however they wanted to or however they pleased. And he says, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past. In other words, those Christians he was speaking to used to be one of them. Walking in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. That is, it was natural for, uh, to look around and see people doing what they wanted to do or doing as they pleased. It wasn't natural in the sense that God made them that way, right? It wasn't natural in that sense. It was just natural in the sense that that's how everybody was doing it. It looked natural because that's how everybody else did it. In Mark 7, verse 20, Jesus says, that which cometh out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murderers, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile the man. Any imaginations to change the church defile the church they defile the man in Isaiah 55 Isaiah 55 beginning of verse 6 the prophet says seek ye the Lord while he may be found call ye upon him while he is near let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. 
God's word is powerful enough to accomplish what God intended for it to accomplish. It can save the soul. It can cause a man to change his ways. It can cause a man to forsake the way of the unrighteous and to seek the Lord. But it can also be perverted, as we pointed out earlier this morning. Any changes, obviously, that come from within the man are not for good. In Acts chapter 3, and we'll look at a few examples here from Acts with regard to the intent that God had to change the hearts of men and not the other way around. Acts chapter 3, verse 18. We read those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer he has so fulfilled. Repent or change ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now drop down to verse 26. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, notice, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Everything God did as it applied to the church and even before the church really was to prepare a way for man to take care of the greatest problem we've ever had and that's sin sin separates us from God Isaiah 59 1 and 2 and God loved the world God loves all men he wants all men to to be saved. He wants all men to come to a knowledge of the truth. He wants all men to be reconciled, to repent, and to be converted, to change uh, their lives to be in harmony with Him. And when it came to the church, He made it possible for individuals to be reconciled back to Him, to have their sins washed away, and to live a life so as to be pleasing to God. Live a life so as to mirror the example that Jesus set forth in his life here on this earth. And it included doing away with the things of the past and changing one's disposition towards that past. What Paul referred to as the course of this world, the lust of the flesh and fulfilling the desires of the mind. Forsaking that and choosing to follow after the mind of God. To turn away from wickedness, to turn away from unrighteousness, to turn away from iniquity. To live a new life. Not a life of doing as one pleases. Not a life of wickedness or following iniquities. But a life of turning away from those things. Changing from what seemed natural. Now why did it seem to be natural? Because it seemed like all men were doing it. So God wanted men to turn away from that which seemed natural 
to do that which seemed unnatural, which is follow God. Right? But what do men want to do today? They want to change what makes us peculiar. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 through verse 9, right? They want to change that which makes us a holy priesthood. They want to change that which makes us sanctified or set apart for the Master's use. They want us to be natural or look like the rest of the world. Many of the man-made imaginations that have crept into the church have started with denominations down the street. Look at what they're doing. This seems like a good idea. And you know, it might have been a good idea. But what makes it a good idea is to go to the Bible to find out if it's something that we ought to do or ought not to do. Not whether someone down the street's doing it. What someone does down the street could be good, it could be bad. But it's not our standard. It's not why we determine why we do a thing. We shouldn't want to change the church to look like every other man-made organization that we see out there because the church is not man-made. The church was built by God. It was purchased by the blood of Christ. It was intended to be separate from the world. It was intended to be different. It was intended to be peculiar. It was intended to be strange, if you will, as opposed to what the rest of the world saw as nature or natural, what everybody else was doing. But man wants to make the church that God wanted to be separate from the world just like the world. They, they, they want just the opposite, don't they, of what God wanted. God wanted the, the Word, the seed of the kingdom, to change the hearts of men. But men want to change the Word. And they want to change the kingdom. They want to change the church. In Acts chapter 11... Verses 19 through verse 21. We read, They which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. Let me start over. They which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word. To, to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. I ask you, is this how the church is to work today? In other words, if it worked back then, why would it not work today? Notice, they were scattered abroad, preaching the Word. Preaching the Word. Notice verse 20. They spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Verse 21. The hand of the Lord was with them. I did a sermon not too long ago about how the hand of the Lord was with Ezra. Right? And we pointed out how the hand of the Lord was with Ezra and why the hand of the Lord was with Ezra. And it all had to go back to the fact that Ezra knew what God wanted and he did what God wanted. Why was the hand of the Lord was with, with these people? Because they were doing what God wanted. And what were they doing? They were preaching the Word. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Why? Because the Word was powerful enough to turn the hearts of men. The Word of God was strong enough to convert. Now what has changed 
that, mean, that means we need to change how we convert today. Is the Word of God not powerful enough to convert today? The implication, whether they mean to or not, is that the Word can't do its job. That we need something else. That people, uh, we're losing this. We're losing young people. We're losing uh, people's attention. Because all we've got is the Word of God. And the Word of God just isn't enough. Now the truth is, to some people, the Word has never been enough. Right? Even in the first century, there were people who hated Jesus. There were people who saw His miracles. There were disciples who followed Him and then, there, and then after a while chose not to walk with Him anymore. John 6, verse 66. There's always been people who chose to follow something other than the Word of God. Did that mean there was a problem with the Word? No, it was a problem with the man's heart. We need to stop worrying about changing the church and start worrying about changing man's heart. And when we think that we need to change the Word of God to, to make people feel more comfortable... We're not asking people to change their hearts anymore, are we? That's not what the religious world wants to promote, is that people have to change. The religious world wants people to think they can stay exactly where they are. <laughs> Do what you want. Come as you are. No need to change. We will change around what you want it to be. Obviously, if man changes around man's desires, then that church no longer belongs to God. It's been hijacked. The religious world has been hijacked. The word church has been hijacked. When people say the word church, you don't know what they mean anymore today. Sometimes they're talking about the large Catholic denomination. Sometimes they talk about a brick building. The word church has been hijacked by the religious world and, and even atheists. They've redefined it. People have changed what they think right, about those things rather than changing their thinking to fit what God made it. It's our responsibility to continue to defend God's definitions about what the church is. And that's why we make sure that we explain to people why the church can't change. Any change is made to the church and it ceases to be the church. In Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 26, beginning of verse 15. You'll remember Paul recounting his conversion. Paul, once known as Saul, was a very zealous individual, wasn't he? And we don't deny that many individuals who want to change the church are very zealous. Okay, we don't deny that. There are a lot of folks who uh, are zealous, and sometimes some of them may be more zealous for what they believe than members of the church. As we drove here this morning, we saw cars flooding into parking lots. Flooding into parking lots. No doubt in my mind, sincere people thinking they're doing good, zealous to practice what they believe. And then there may be members of the church not zealous enough 
to get up or to be here. We don't deny their zeal. We just know that their zeal is not according to knowledge, as the Bible says. Their zeal has led them in the wrong direction. Saul was a man with such zeal, right? He persecuted the church. He thought the church was something that was trying to change Judaism. When in fact, Judaism had been nailed to the cross. Colossians 2 verse 14. Jesus had nailed it to the cross and taken it out of the way. Fulfilled the law. Instituted a new law. And so, the zealous man who was zealous but wrong, right? Was seeking to stop the church from doing its job. And of course, uh, in verse uh, 14, Saul is on the way to imprison Christians. Perhaps have them killed. And on the way, he hears a voice in the Hebrew tongue that says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And Paul says, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And it's interesting here, Paul was not persecuting Jesus in the flesh, was he? He wasn't throwing any rocks at Jesus. He wasn't putting Jesus in jail. But he was persecuting the church Jesus purchased with his blood. Now when we try to change Jesus' church today, who does Jesus consider that an assault on? So Jesus tells him, rise, verse 16, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So Paul here recounting how he changed his heart and changed his mind. And of course we go back to Acts 9 and we know the rest of the story. Paul is blind. He goes into the city. Um, He meets Ananias. Ananias preaches unto him Jesus. Saul believes it. He's baptized. His sight comes back and he goes to work doing what Jesus wanted him to do. Paul initially, or Saul's initial zeal was to stop the church. And now he had a change of heart, a change in mind, and he's promoting the church. That's what God wants. God wants men to change their hearts, not to try to change God. So notice verse 19. Paul's saying, this is what went down. And he says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. I did what I was told. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Is what God called Paul to do good enough for today? If if Jesus said, I chose Paul for this great mission to promote the church, and Paul says that mission was this, to preach repentance and to turn to God and to do works that, is, that are associated with repentance. In other words, prove it. <laughs> right? Prove it. Works meet for repentance means, number one, I have to stop sinning. 
You know, you can say, well, I repented, but if you're continuing to do the same sin over and over again, that's hard to prove. Is that not what God wants us to do today? Why is that not considered the Great Commission, right? You know, apparently people don't think the Great Commission is that great. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Verse 18, Jesus says, All power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Is there any authority beyond that? Can you have any more power than that? All, all power, heaven and earth. And so you'd think Jesus at this time, would have been smart enough and knowledgeable enough, omnipotent, omniscient enough, with all this power to, do what, to, to say whatever he needed to say to the church that he purchased with his own blood. I mean, the church means something to Jesus, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, he died for it. He hanged on a cross for it. He suffocated to death for it. His blood shed for it. He died for it. The church, if it means anything to anybody, it means something to Jesus. So Jesus, with all power and all authority, on earth and heaven, no, no greater power or authority anywhere, who obviously loved the church and had a connection to the church like nobody else, who is omniscient, who is omnipotent, if there was something the church needed, you'd think he would have explained it right here, wouldn't he? And what did he say? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Jesus thought this was enough. With all His power, with all His authority, with all His omniscience to know the future, He knew in His love for the church what He wanted for the church. And it's very simple, isn't it? Go teach. Make Christians by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit by their authority. And teach them to observe all the things I've taught you. Now how long are we going to do that, Jesus? Is there one day when that's just not enough? How long should we do this? How long should this commission be great? And then we start another commission that's greater. Because obviously what's, this ain't keeping our children. Or this ain't doing that. Or this ain't growing the big crowds. Or we're not, people are falling asleep and we're not keeping people awake and we're not we're not incur we're not edifying people people aren't excited so when does the greater commission come into effect jesus says teach them to observe all things whatsoever i've commanded you and he did all that in the first century everything he taught them was in the first century and notice what he says i'm with you always to the end of the world According to Jesus, this commission is great right now. Sadly, our friends don't realize that when they say this commission's not great for today, they're saying Jesus didn't know what he was talking about. They're saying that Jesus was wrong. That today we need something greater than the Great Commission. That preaching the Word is not enough to turn people from their sins. That the truth itself is not powerful enough to save and to keep saved. Let me point out here that when, I, when we discussed this morning and this afternoon that 
the church doesn't change. We're talking about all the things that God charted as obligatory for the church. Doctrinal matters. It's organization. It's worship. It's, it's, it's mission, right? All those things that God authorized, created, and planned. Those things should not change. And that's why we don't change. And we pointed out why those things don't change. It was perfect when He built it. It was perfect when He died for it. It was perfect because He gave us all the words needed to produce it. Truth hasn't changed. The church doesn't need to change. The seed is intended to change the hearts of man, not the other way around. But what we're not saying is that we can use technological advances to assist us in doing these things. And I may do a sermon on that coming up. Obviously, things have changed. We enjoy worshiping in an air-conditioned building. But we didn't change our worship. We didn't change the day on which worship uh, occurs. We didn't change anything about the church. Right? Nothing changed about the church. We enjoy comfortable, soft chairs. Right? We can, we can take advantage of those. We use video. We use audio. We use the internet to do the work of the Lord. We've not changed the work of the Lord. Right? We do what the church did in the first century. And we take advantage of the expedite, the expeditions or the, the technology that we have to expedite that. Paul preached in every city, but he had to walk. We drive in a car, but we didn't change what we preach, right? We may have changed how we got there, but we didn't change what we preached. And there's a big difference. And so we point out that there's nothing wrong with using technology or, or using advances to help us, but that's a big difference from what these other folks are talking about. They like to conflate the two together, right? They like to conflate the two together as if adding an orchestra is the same as using air conditioning, right? They want to make it the same when it's obviously not. To add an orchestra is to change singing. You've changed singing. You're no longer singing, you're playing and singing. You may not even be singing, you may just be listening to playing but you've changed that act of worship so there's a big difference but when it comes to how God built his church and what God wanted for his church there's nothing that needs to be changed there's nothing that could be bettered and there will not be anything in the future that God wants us to change about his church the only thing that God wants to change is our heart. He wants us to turn from wickedness. He wants us to turn from darkness and go to the light. He wants us to change our heart's desires from one of selfish to one of submission. The desires of man cannot save. The church was not built upon those desires of men. Paul told the church at Ephesus it was the word of God, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. And so if we're to be saved, we need to follow God's pattern. We need to follow after God's choosing. We need to only do what God authorizes and commands as it applies to the church. And that's why the church can't change. And it's important 
for a sermon like this to be preached. And as I mentioned this morning, I hope there are many preachers preaching this on a regular basis. I don't think it's being done based upon what's happening to the church and the religious world. Because changes are happening all the time. And it's sad. There used to be a day, I'm a pretty young fella still, I suppose. I've got a lot of gray hair though, but there used to be a day that I'm sure almost everybody in here, most of you will remember. You could go from any town to any town. And if the sign said Church of Christ, you could walk in. And you'd know exactly what they were going to teach. You'd know exactly what they believed. And today, you have to do a lot of homework. The signs don't mean anything today. A lot of signs say Church of Christ today, and you don't know what they teach. You don't know what they believe. One of the old restoration preachers, I forget who it was, was asked a question about what the Church of Christ taught on a certain issue, and he said, it's untelling. <laughs> it's untelling what the Church of Christ teaches. And his point was this. We don't need to teach what somebody else teaches. We need to see what God teaches. Right? And boy, if he thought that then, what would he think now? But if we teach what God says, we can produce Christians and we can produce faithful congregations of the Lord's church. And that's important for us. And then we do the best we can from there on out. But I hope this will help you and motivate you and hopefully we can pass this on to our friends and share the, the importance of making sure that the church doesn't change. I'd like to have somewhere to worship when I get old. <laughs> right? And I'm afraid that there might be a day when I can't find the church. Sad. But the church can exist as long as we have God's word. And as long as we follow it. And so the lesson's yours. And it's intended hopefully to encourage you and to edify you and to motivate us to, to share this important message to everyone. That the church can't change. We need the church to be exactly as God wanted it. The reason we want it to be exactly the way it wanted is because God added the saved to the church. Acts chapter 2 verse 47. And if we want to be saved, we need to be in that church. And the plan that gets us into heaven is the same plan that gets us into the church. We hear the word, we believe it, we repent of our past sins, we confess that Jesus is the Christ, we're baptized into Christ, the body, the Lord adds us to the church. We've had our sins remitted, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. We're, we're a new creature in Christ. We're a saved individual. We're in the church. We're a Christian. And from that point out, we live our lives worshiping God as the church until the day come when we can't worship any longer. Either our, di our days are over or Jesus comes again. And so we seek to encourage all to keep the church pure so that we can make sure that we're members of that church. If anyone needs to obey the gospel, the invitation is open. If you've already obeyed those initial acts but have some other assist need, we can assist you as we stand and sing. Oh,